live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. And joining me tonight is Delegate Carrie Delaney. She is a freshman delegate in the House of Delegates, having been one of 15 new delegates elected in November of 2017. Thank you so much for being here, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me. So you unseated an incumbent, but one of the things I want to ask you about is sort of like your journey to decide to run when you know that 97% of incumbents win re-election. And that's just, and that's true across all elections every year. So tell us a little bit about how, and this is not your first election either, because I just want to make it clear that you were also on the city council in Florida. Yes. So when you came to Virginia, it's not like you'd never run for office before, but tell us a little bit about your process. Sure. Well, it was all part of the same journey and it all started my first job out of college. I worked at a group home with kids in foster care. And that opened my eyes to a lot of things, um, to really see the struggle of some of our most vulnerable people in our country and the difficulty to navigate a, when, when a system is broken. And my job was to help some of these young people navigate a system that was at times broken or um, at times could be improved. And for me, I, I think I realized very early in my career that policy affects people's lives in a very direct way and it can either serve or fail some of our most vulnerable. And so that was a realization I had fr fresh out of college, first job, that I realized that people who affect policy really do have the ability to, to impact people's lives and, and make a real difference in their community. And I think I knew straight out of school, I was maybe a little too young to jump right in <laughs> the deep water, but I, I think that was where the seed was planted and that was why I started going to local government city council meetings. I thought, well, you know, I got to start somewhere. I want to learn more about how my local government works you know, how, um, how the city works, how the county works, and started going to meetings. And um, when you start going to meetings and getting involved, you know, there, there's opportunities to, you know, get appointed to things, to run for, for local office. And that was where it started for me, was with that ambition to make a difference for people and to be a voice for people. So historically in this country, at every level of government, it has been dominated by men. And, and it still is everywhere, Let state legislators, Congress, a lot of town councils, city councils, it's changing. But when you were younger and you started going to city council meetings and thinking, well, maybe I could, maybe I could do this job, did you ever think that it would be harder for you? Oh, than? absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think we, we as women uh, face a, a multitude of challenges. And, you know, even, even being involved before being a mother, you know, being a young woman, uh, that comes with, you know, uh, an extra layer of proof that yes. you have to, to give that, you know, you're qualified and you're competent and you're smart and you're, you're able to make tough decisions. You have to be better than anybody else who says they're running, who simply showed up and said, I think I can do that job. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you, and you have to be able to, you know, find that confidence and surround yourself with people who, you know, are really able to uh, support you and, and believe in you. And then I think um, as the years went on and I became a mother, you know, you add the other layer of, you know, how are you going to do this with young kids? And I, you know, I can only answer that with, well, for what other reason could I possibly <laughs> imagine doing this other than to make our, our community better for kids, for my kids and for everyone's. Well, it's interesting too that you saw immediately the diff you know, the connection between politics and public policy and quality of life. I find a lot of people will say, I'm not political. I'm not political. Or people who are like, I hate politics. I'm like, so how do you think you get roads or schools or, you know, health care? How do you think you get that if you're like, I don't want to be involved in politics? To me, there is a connect the dots. I don't think in our small d democracy that people always make that connection. I think we're living busy lives a lot of times. I know, um, you know, a lot of people, they get up early in the morning, you know, get the kids ready for school, go off to work, they come home, they make dinner, they maybe have the news on and, you know, we're growing ever more frustrated <laughs> with what we're seeing and, and people are starting to see how things are really starting to affect their day-to-day -day lives. But I think for the most part, it, it's very easy to just keep so busy with your day-to-day -day life. And as long as you don't really see a really direct impact to your quality of life, you don't always feel that connection or that motivation to get involved. It's usually, you know, not until you really see how this affects me personally, am I going to really take the time, you know, to, 
sacrifice time with my family, with my friends, my personal life to get more and more involved. I think we're certainly starting to see that change as people do grow more frustrated with what is happening at the national level. But you know, starting out with the, with the work that I was doing, uh, that that was the eye-opening experience for me. You know, working with foster care, I went on to uh, to be a uh, sexual assault crisis counselor, and again saw another layer of of policy opportunities where we could be serving people a lot better in the victim services arena. And um, and I think we. We all find our niche of how we want to make a difference and I think uh, for whatever reason I was inspired very early on that I saw the ability to affect change at the policy level was, was sort of my calling. So when you came from Florida to Fairfax County, one of the things you were appointed to the library, the Fairfax County Library Board, you know, and so that got you some involvement, but what was like the moment that you decided I'm ready to challenge an incumbent in my district? Well, we did. Uh, I did spend uh, several years getting more and more involved in the community. You know, we we moved uh, to Northern Virginia. Um, you know, when I was in my twenties and was working and uh, kind of what we were describing with just you're, right. you're so busy that when my daughter was born that was when I kind of came out of the house in daylight for the first time <laughs> yeah right I get it. <laughs> and and sort of realized wow you know I, I've been living in this community for a number of years by that point but having my first baby born here in Fairfax County realizing okay this this is our home. This is our forever home here. We're having our children here. This is where they're going to grow up and, and always ask when someone asks, where are you from? They're going to say Chantilly. They're going to say right. Fairfax. This this makes that um, such a uniquely special place when it's where you've had your babies and mm -hmm. where you're raising your children. So, you know, when my daughter was first born and I'm, and I'm kind of emerging out of the house, um, during, during those early months, realizing how important it is to, to be involved in this community was when I picked up the phone and called our county supervisor and said, you know, I'd, I'd like to serve. How, you know, where, where can you use me? Here's my, here's my skill set. That's great. Uh, so I was appointed first to Citizen Court Council, uh, went on to become the chair of that, and then from there, library board, and went on to become the chair of the library board. And so serving in the, on those two boards really gave me a sense of who our community is. It, it's especially working with the libraries, I found um, I mean, every, every member of the community comes to the library. It's kind That's of the great true. equalizer. And you really get to know who your community is um, and, and what the unique needs of your community are. And so for me, that, that was a very eye-opening experience just to really get to know my district, um, my county on, on a much more personal level and further inspire me to, to want to serve. And so I think you know, working in, in that uh, area and just getting to know the community, getting to know the needs of the community while, you know, looking at the, the voting record of, of the opponent that I went on to challenge um, was was really what kind of lit the fire for me to decide to do this. So what, what was the conversation like over coffee? Like, honey, there's something I want to talk to you about because I'm <laughs> thinking I might want to run for the House of Delegates. Something like that, you know, and I think uh, my husband, has, he's always been incredibly supportive of, of my ambitions and I think um, because he'd been with me from the beginning when I originally, you know, was 20 whatever and saying, gosh, you know, someday I'd like to be in a position where I can affect the kind of change that can really help these people because I'm working one person at a time. And that is so hard and to do direct services. And I get that the, the urge to solve an immediate crisis mm -hmm. and problem. But if you can't solve the environment that created the problem, right. you're spinning your wheels. It's incredibly frustrating. And, and I had those moments of frustration where, you know, for that one person, you're making all the difference in the world and that makes it worth doing it. But, you know, you have every day you're putting out a fire that for that individual that you're navigating the system with is everything. To right. them, you get to go home, but to that person, it's everything. And and, and that can be both incredibly rewarding, but then incredibly frustrating, frustrating. when you realize that, okay, I've, I've put out one fire, but there's a much bigger problem. So, you know, my husband had been with me through all of, you know, that early career of mine and, and the conversations that we had. So I think he probably saw this coming <laughs> and knew that moment would come where I'd sit down and say, you know, um, I'm thinking I might like to run for this office. And I don't think it surprised him. Um, of course, you know, having young kids, having the balance, the life that, you know, we would have to balance was obviously some logistical questions that we wanted to make sure that we had 
answered because you know once I made that commitment we knew we were going to be all in and so you know how, taking the time to talk with other delegates talk to other people about how one balances with the work family dynamic with this with this very you know time consuming um, job it really is and, you, and it's the whole family it's it the is. whole family the whole family and I know that Gretchen Bulova always tells prospective candidates your whole family has to because everybody's affected by it and the campaign is strenuous enough I mean the, the door knocking every day and every weekend and the phone calls and the call time but then when you actually get to the legislature and we'll talk a little bit more about that in other segments the actually the governance part you're away from home mm -hmm. for 45 mm -hmm. or 60 days right and so this is you've got to have somebody on the ground at home who can make the school lunches, sign the permission slips, get right. them on the bus, all the things that people do every day right. when you've got two parents in mm -hmm. the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a big commitment from everybody. So I think it's it's something that the whole family really has to believe in. I mean, you have to you know have a, a support network uh, that really believes that this is this is for the greater good because we're all sacrificing. I mean, I'm sacrificing a lot of my personal time. My husband is sacrificing a lot as well. So he's got to believe in this just right. as much as I do and feel that this is uh, is important for our community that we have a voice someone that's really committed to standing up for for people and um, unfortunately you know we have that partnership but it you know affects kids too because I'm away does. from you know from my family and um, you know not only the the strenuous time during the campaign where you're really out seven days a week but as you mentioned being down in Richmond for 45 or 60 days uh, you know we're home on weekends but there's those long week stretches sure. that you know it, it's um, it, it it is a lot that we're asking of our families, but I think there's so much potential for growth and learning, for especially for the kids, to really see ex government at their fingertips. And it still surprises me, and I'm sure maybe this, nobody's ever asked this, but women, women still get asked, so who's keeping your kids? Oh, absolutely. And, and, <laughs> and I've had one person say to me when somebody asked her, who's keeping your kids? She goes, uh, well, who's keeping yours? Right. Right. Like, who's keeping That's yours? That's right. That's right. That's it's a reflexive thing how right. people still see parenting roles and who is the primary parent. And I think for kids to understand, you know, parents have different jobs that require different things and there's not necessarily a gender role. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that those lessons are so incredible for the kids to get to witness that too. You know, that when I think about um, you know, how many times I might be away at night or away during the week. Um, I, I can really balance that out with the idea that, you know, I could talk all day to, you know, my five-year-old son about how we're all equal and we share responsibilities, but there's nothing quite as um, compelling as seeing mommy go off to, you know, to do my role and daddy do, make dinner. <laughs> that's right, to do the job. And I think that is amazing that your children are able to see you walking that, yeah. that walk. When we come back from this break, we are going to talk further with Delegate Carrie Delaney from House District 67, which is Park Fairfax, Park Loudoun County, and we're going to hear more about her experience as one of the freshmen of 15. Gotcha. <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. We have a gun. What's up? We have a gun. Hmm, maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. Love it. Cross-referencing travel sites and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Last night at high school... I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <sighs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. What to expect when you're expecting? Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to team-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. 
preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the mom. You don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. We are talking with Delegate Carrie Delaney this evening. Thank you so much for being here, Carrie. This is, to me, phenomenal that we get to talk about your experience in both running and switching gears immediately after you ran to figure out what this job is you just signed up for, right? Absolutely. I think that, that was possibly the biggest surprise was how quickly it moves because you're, you know, you're running your campaign and then all of a sudden election night comes, you find out that you've won, and you have a matter of weeks w that are, of course, mind you, right before holidays start. <laughs> right, because this was October 6th. So, so we, we get elected in, in November. 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 We get elected 6th, in November, November and then um, we're down there in January. We've right. got to figure out, we have to hire staff. We have to figure out what bills we're going to file, start drafting that legislation, start submitting those drafts, um, get you know get an office assignment, get that set up, figure out where we're going to live down in right. Richmond. <laughs> right. Because you know that was that, those some of those little details you don't want to jinx yourself and think do too much. Before. Right. Right. Like, because you're right. <laughs> so you know there there's um but and so there's a lot that you have to figure out right before you assume office and get sworn in in a very short period of time. That happens to also involve, uh, you know, the, the Christmas holidays and right. Thanksgiving and everything else. And this was a huge group this year. I it mean, was. you know, sometimes it's two or three seats that flip. Like I said, not, incumbents win 97% of the time. So to have 15, and a lot of the, the, those seats were held by incumbents, mm -hmm. and we have brand new, inexperienced freshman delegates. So talk a little bit about what the the sitting delegates, the incumbent Democrats did to help mm -hmm. you too. Like, I'm assuming that it was all hands on deck. It was all hands on deck. We had a really great training uh, first with our caucus, the Democratic caucus put together a training for the Democratic members, and then um, the, the House of Delegates, the clerk, uh, put together a bipartisan orientation as well. So we spent some time down in Richmond pretty quickly after our elections, just really learning floor procedure, learning some of the technicalities, but then, you know, I'd, I'd had the benefit of getting to know a lot of the, the local incumbents from this region, so I had, at that point had people like a call up and say, well, where do you stay? Right. <laughs> do I need to, you know, do you need to book something now? You know, so some of the, just the little logistics that no one really talks about because you're so busy running and that's kind of background noise when you're doing an operation as big as a, you know, as a full-time campaign. But then suddenly those things become pretty important yeah. <laughs> to figure out, you know, this, how do you do the do, job? How do you do the job? Where, where is the office? Um, you know, how, how does it work? And so you have a pretty quick amount of time to not only get all that infrastructure set up for your office, get your team assembled, um, but then you also have to be ready to submit legislation. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges for a new member coming in is that short turnaround time because you're going to have, you know, you, you've got some great ideas that you've been mulling around during your campaign for bills. Because part of your running is saying, these are the problems that I want to solve. It right? is. So, so there are planks in your platform. It, definitely. And I think, though, that, the, you know, the thing to consider, though, is a lot of what you talk about when you're running are, are the bigger scale, you know, talking about health care, talking about, you know, big issues. That as a freshman delegate, that's not necessarily the, the right. bill you're going to be the chief patron on. On. You're gonna you're gonna fight for it. You're gonna vote for it. You're gonna be involved in getting those things through. That's why we were elected, and that's what we came to do. Unfortunately, as in yeah, terms we, of healthcare, we delivered. Yes, yes, it's pretty Medicaid exciting. Expan yeah, that Medicaid we were, expansion. Absolutely. Um, but there there's um, there's all of the other issues that you might have heard about at the doors. You know, when you're knocking on doors, talking to people during your campaign, and it's not the big glamorous issue that is necessarily going to be part of your campaign platform, but it's a really real problem to a constituent who now is hoping that you're going to be that voice to, to fight for that issue and, you know, putting together those ideas and doing it in such a quick period of time where you got to figure out who are my stakeholders, how do I craft this language to make sure that I can actually get it passed because we are in the minority and so I've got to make sure that I've got some folks on the other side of the aisle that are going to be interested in the bills that I'm putting forward if I want to make sure that I can affect the, the change I want to. <laughs> I think one of the one of the greatest examples of running on an issue that matters to people is Danica Rowe. 
and at Netroots Nation, she was on a panel of out women who run for office, and they were saying, so, you know, exactly, you know, how did you run as a, as a transgender woman? And she goes, I ran on Route 28. Right. I ran on transportation. I've lived in this community my entire life. It was about Route 28. That's what my people care about. And so it was very interesting to understand that it's the kitchen table issues. Absolutely. You know, trying to get to work, trying to get home, trying to get anywhere if you live around Route 28. But the interesting thing, too, about Danica Rome, who was the first transgender um, legislator elected in any legislature in the United States, is that we have this sort of archaic way that our General Assembly has always addressed one another. And that kind of went away. And what was that experience like? It, it did. So we're, we're about to be celebrating 400 years 400 of the years. General Assembly, yeah. lar longest continually operating legislative body legislative in body. the Western Hemisphere. Western Hemisphere. So we've got some history behind us. And um, traditionally, my colleagues that came before me referred to each other as the gentleman and the gentlewoman from their, their county. Right. Um, and yes, that, that went away this past session. And so I think that, you know, it was a, uh, one could speculate as to why that might have suddenly gone there away. Was, yeah, there, was some, there was some controversy <laughs> about, you know, well, you know, why, because it was the majority, if I'm not mistaken, you know, the, the, you know, the majority, did, was this voted on? Is this, or did the speaker make this decision? How did this come about? Well, if I recall, it was early on when we were setting rules, but um, my, my memory on this is it was, it was sort of dictated that this is how it's it was be. going to be and, and going so, forward. <laughs> right. So some people took this to be, um, you know, something um, negative about Danica Rome. I personally was cheering in the grandstand saying, I don't care what it took. We should have done this about a hundred years ago. It should be delegate gender neutral, call me by my title, this is who I am and what I do. So I personally celebrated the fact that now everyone refers to themselves as, or to each other mm -hmm. as delegate and senator. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it may have kind of um, forced us towards a more progressive yeah, right. way of referring to one another than maybe would have happened otherwise. So it is, it is a bit of irony that that was how it, it came was to very, be. It was <laughs> very ironic, but I loved it. I loved it. And I'm, I'm applauding the fact that we now have this gender neutral term that is very professional and speaks to the title that people have in both chambers. I'm all about that. But tell us some of the things that kind of surprised you as you, you, you sat in your first session and they gaveled it in and, and just the trying to make legislation. What was that? And it was a 60-day session this year? It was a 60-day session. So that was, it was a long session because we did have a budget. Um, and so I think, you know, the most surprising, um, and, and I feel like I, I'm asked that question a lot about what's surprising. I went, I went down with so little expectation of what it was going to be like because I knew that no matter what I had in my head, it was probably going to be a little bit different than that. Yeah, true. <laughs> so um, I tried to go down, like no surprises. I'm just, I'm going to go down there, eyes wide open, ready for whatever comes. I think the pace that we operate at, I, if you know, is, is probably what what did surprise me the most. That I knew it was going to be fast, but kind of going back to that, you know, you win an election and then you've got a matter of weeks to get your staff, figure out your bills, file your bills, actually get ready. But then you're down, you, you do go down, you get sworn in, you're getting committee assignments. And once those committees start meeting, I mean, bills just kind of flood before you. There and are thousands of them. Thousands of pieces thousands of legislation of that, that have to be very quickly decided on. And so the, um, you know, just the, the operation behind that, that you want to make sure that you're making really solid decisions, well calculated, evidence-based decisions um, on, on a bill that you know you are getting a few hours sometimes before you may have to vote for it. And right. building relationships with the subject matter experts becomes absolutely critical because we look at legislation that deals with such a wide spectrum of issues that we all come from our own unique professional background. We might have some unique experiences where we know a thing or two about a certain issue better than someone else, but there is no one legislator that's going to know everything about every type of bill that comes before us. And so it becomes so important to build the relationship so that you know that if you get a bill on a certain topic, that you know who are the subject matter experts on that that can give you the data, they can give you you know, the background and help you make the most evidence-based decision possible. So let's talk about some of the players. So you're not down there by yourselves. Most of us look in the chamber and it's like, oh, these are the people who are like voting yes or voting no on bills. But these committees start meeting at seven o'clock in the morning. And, and, and so it's 
committee meetings, floor session, people come to visit you in your office, you have receptions and all kinds of evening things every night. So from morning to night, dawn to dusk, you are meeting, talking, reviewing, reading, something. You've got lobbyists, you've got advocates, mm -hmm. you've got constituents, you've got other kinds of subject matter experts. Right. This is a lot of people all in the mix trying to get your time and attention. I mean, how hard is it just to manage that piece of it? I mean, that's a huge piece of it. And I, and I would say that arguably that's one of the most important pieces of it is to listen to those voices because, you know, our constituents elected us to make good decisions that are going to, you know, help improve our communities and the lives of the people that sent us there to represent them. And so making very well calculated decisions is, is probably the most, I mean, that's what we're there to do. And, um, and making tough decisions, being able to weigh out all that information when sometimes you can have two sides of an issue that both have compelling arguments, but you have, you, you are there to do the job of voting and you have to make a decision and really trying to listen as clearly as you can to, um, to the, the people who are the stakeholders, you know, if they're lobbyists who know a lot about an issue, hearing what they have to say, hearing both sides of that issue, listening to stakeholders, and then listening to constituents. We get a lot of calls and a lot of emails from from the people in our districts uh, letting us know how they would like us to vote on a particular piece of legislation. And how helpful is that in your, you know, because a lot of people are like, well, what difference does a phone call make? Well, if I send an email, does anybody even read it? Well, does going down there make a difference? I mean, how important is it for your constituents to be organized and to know that a bill is coming up, what the language says, where they're, and then to tell you that? It's incredibly important. I mean, I think, you know, that is, that is fundamentally what we are there to do, is to listen to the people who elected us and to make decisions based on the best information that we have. And, um, and that's, that's ultimately what we're there to do. Now, we might not agree with everyone on every issue. You I might have, you can't agree with everybody. I'm going to have constituents <laughs> that are coming to me about something. Opposite sides. Opposite sides, both opposite asking sides. me to vote the way or that something they, and vote yeah, against. right, exactly. Um, and, but I think that, you know, what, what I owe everyone that, that I represent, um, is, is that time to listen and hear because sometimes even though you might not agree with somebody, they might offer a perspective that you hadn't considered because it's not part of your life experience to have necessarily approached it from a certain perspective. So everyone that we represent is going to have a unique perspective on something and it's important to hear that because even if, even if at the end of the day I end up voting the opposite of how they wanted me to vote, it's very important to me to hear the full argument and to hear all sides of the issue because sometimes there is that opportunity to negotiate language and that you know we, we can vote yes or no but there's also the opportunity to say well have we considered this portion and make make a, a small change that and you, could and find make, common ground and you're making an informed vote like i heard you all and i had to make a decision but at least i was informed when i right. made that decision right. and people respect that i do think that people want to be heard at the end of the day absolutely when we speaking of being heard when we come back from this break we are going to talk further with delegate carrie delaney so please join us okay so we drowned the fire yep stirred it mm -hmm. drowned it again mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold yeah Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it.
big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. You know, and the salary. Oh my god, yes. I right? mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move in with my parents, and <laughs> right before, yeah, right. so this saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from someone. <laughs> These are cool. Did you, um, what did you? We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. Talking with me tonight is Delegate Carrie Delaney of House District 67 here in Northern Virginia. Thank you so much for being here, Carrie. This has been fascinating so far. And one of the things I think people associate you most strongly with is the piece of legislation known as the recess bill. Like you, you hit a home run <laughs> right out of the park first time. Easily the, the most arguably fun bill of the General Assembly it was. session. It captured everybody's <laughs> imagination. Everybody was talking about it. But the great thing about it, you know, it's a fun bill, but it also makes a huge difference in the lives of kids. And it's a real, um, it's a real great example of solving a problem that uh, was, you know, a very really clear common sense issue that, you know, everyone could kind of come together and find that common ground and agree that, yeah, you know what, I think kids do better academically and behaviorally when they've had the chance to blow off a little steam and run around and, and uh, have that mental break as well. Uh, so it was a real common sense bill that I, I am so excited to watch as more and more districts across Virginia there's expand. Three, three so there's far? Uh, there's a, probably more than that. I feel like every day I'm seeing some other district that's yeah, doubling it's Loudon, or expanding. Fairfax, but in this Prince region, William. in this region, it's Loudon, Loudon, Fairfax, and Prince William. But I'm hearing of districts in other parts of the state that are either considering it or expanding it at this point. So we're continuing to see more and more school districts uh, taking advantage of the legislation and expanding recess. And I'm just so excited to see the improved outcomes for our students. When absolutely, when I they mean, have anybody this. who has small children, especially small children, they're not designed to sit still for long periods of time. You just can't hold your attention. They need to move around. That's right. Even adults do. They say that we should be moving around like every 45 minutes. We should at least stand up, right? Exactly. And for kids, it's even less. And there, there is just, you know, the mountains of, of evidence, neurological evidence, uh, you know, pediatricians will, will be able to tell you uh, that the, the child's brain really needs these physical and mental breaks in order to perform better. And so as we become more and more concerned with test scores and academic Academic performance, you know, that's that's probably again a topic for another show to even I know. discuss. We're so, we're so focused on that, and we're, they're just we're missing the boat uh, on many other things. But I think you know, as we as we are putting that pressure on our students to do well academically, we've got to look at the evidence to say, okay, well, how do we actually do that? And I don't think that it's adding more academic time. I think that it is offering children the best opportunity best opportunity to learn. And there is so much evidence to show that the best opportunity to learn that part of that is having a lot of recess time because the brain just come it, you know you decompress you come back to the classroom actually ready to listen and yeah. ready to learn you know and there's other things like social emotional skills which we talk about but doesn't really get a lot of focus and one of the things about being on the playground you know I was on the playground you had kickball teams and you played jacks and you mm -hmm. you jumped rope and you did things that required you to negotiate in a different way friendships relationships taking turns right you know winning and losing right 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 that was recess when I grew up. And so I think we're this focus on test scores and achievement and how do we measure whether or not kids are doing well in school, we've kind of lost sight of the fact that there's all kinds of things learned on the playground. That's right. That's right. That it, it is. It, it helps with that social emotional learning while it also readies the brain for the academic learning. So it was a really exciting bill to carry and I think just a really great example too of citizen involvement at its best. I mean, this is the perfect example of, um, you know, some fellow moms like me, right. who had their kindergartners and young elementary school kids coming home, exhausted at the end of the day. They're getting notes home or calls and emails from the teacher saying that they're having these behavioral issues or, you know, having a hard time sitting still. And I don't know, maybe, maybe they should be referred for an ADHD assessment. And, you know, these parents just feeling completely blindsided by well hold on well, what happened you know this wasn't an issue until we started school and then they took a look at their child's schedule and realized that they were in the classroom for hours 
without right. a recess break. And these parents you know, uh, organized, started a Facebook, Facebook group and began organizing, started going to, started with their classroom teacher, started, went up to the principal, went up to the school board, and just kept finding that, well, we'd love to change this, but, you know, whatever that hurdle was, and ultimately time. found that it was at the state level right. where the fix needed to happen. And so this was a group of parents who, um, approached their legislators and said, hey, this is a problem that we see. Do you think you can fix this? And it was a, a really exciting bill for me to carry because I, I do have young kids myself. This was this was after school talk on the playground that I've been part of as a parent. Friends of mine coming up saying, hey, you, you're in the House of Delegates now. Right. <laughs> you think can you can you do, do something about this? I'm like, well, let me tell you. I'm so excited to tell you about this bill that I'm carrying because that was the conversation that we'd have sometimes after school with some of my friends. So that was your perspective, but tell us about your other co-patron who came at it from a different perspective. He's from Louisa County. He is uh, of a different party. But each of you came together, but his perspective was unique as well. Yeah, it was it was a great example of, of a bipartisan bill just because it was just such a common sense problem solving bill. And so um, Delegate McGuire uh, it works in um, kind of the fitness and, and athletic uh, arena and has worked, he came to me you know, to talk about this bill and had some really compelling stories of individuals that he'd worked with who had you know, suffered various injuries, traumatic brain injuries, and he'd really seen firsthand and had read a lot of the scientific studies about how exercise and physical activity, the effect that it has on the whole brain and neurological system. And he'd seen firsthand through some of the people that he'd worked with in his fitness business, people had overcome uh, tremendous hurdles right. because of that opportunity to have more physical activity in their life, that they'd overcome um, you know, hurdles with, with injuries that they might have experienced and, and really saw unbelievable improvements in quality of life. So he was very passionate about what we were doing too. And so it was a really good opportunity for um, not only for the, the advocates who were just tireless uh, right. to come and really push for this bill. So it really does, again, speak to you You do have a voice and you making that phone call and sending that email and coming to Richmond makes a difference because it's exactly what this group of more recess advocates did to push this bill through. But to also just find that common ground across the aisle because, I mean, we had 30-something um, co-patrons on this bill. But, you know, Everybody wanted to be part uh, of it. Don't you love it? I was like, no, I just won't vote for it, <laughs> but put me on that patron list. And, and a chief co-patron across the aisle who, you know, we, we found that common ground um, together and, you know, had a lot of conversations as we worked the language of the bill, you know, working across the aisle um, in the education committee to make sure that, you know, we, we had the language just right to have bipartisan support, to have our conference committee members work with me to make sure the language was just right to have that bipartisan support. Um, it, it was really about what was best for the kids. And there's not, that, it's not always the, the way that things feel in politics. There's, there's a lot of uh, divisiveness. There's a lot of fr moments of frustration when you see those party line votes and you see that. It is very frustrating. That hard line between one party or another. So when those moments do come where you realize that, you know, while yes, we disagree on a lot of things that we can still sometimes put all that aside, come to the same table and agree that, okay, this is the right thing to do. How do we, how do we phrase this so that all of us can be comfortable voting for it? Well, I think you really had the, the, the most fun bill of the entire session that people in the Senate and the House really felt good about. It got a lot of press, you know, people were like, yes, recess, we can all get behind this. But not all of your bills were like that. One of the ones closest to your heart is the whole kinship, you know, foster care and supporting families that are in a kinship relationship. And that one didn't fare so well. And that actually happens more often than it doesn't happen. Well, we, well, well, my version of the bill was was rolled into a Republican freshman delegate's version as well, which did pass, and yeah. so I was able to be the cho chief co-patron of that bill. And so that was that was exciting to to see that that was something that we both had a passion for. Again, coming from different perspectives, but both having that child welfare uh, passion and being able to make a compelling argument about why this is so important in a way that um, that can reach people of, you know, from different viewpoints. And so what, so how has that progressed? I mean, what do you see happening with that legislation? Well, now that um, you know, we, we've been able to pass, uh, pass the bill uh, this session, we're going to be able to see families that are, um, where a child has to go into foster care, um, that that child is, is 
best placed with a family member, right. someone who knows them, someone that they're they're comfortable with. But that family member isn't always in a position to take on a new uh, you know a new family right. member to um, you know to the expense that comes with opening their home. Um, so what happens when that family member says, "Well, I, I would love to take." this child, but I simply do not have the financial capacity to do this, that child's placed in foster care. And the foster, and care foster family parents receive a stipend. Now, right. it's not a lot, but it's something. And so the, the wisdom behind kinship care is that if we were able to offer that assistance to the family member, that will, they were going to be spending it anyway in the foster right. home, right. it reduces trauma to the child, which there's been a growing body of evidence that shows that trauma and it's, uh, the effects of trauma on especially a child has lasting mental and physical health effects in well into their adult life. And so the, the benefits of reducing trauma are, are not only um, you know, fiscal, because you're you're helping someone's long-term health, but it's really uh, it's the, the ethical the thing to do. It is better for the child. But so once you pass a bill, this is a good example. Once you pass a bill, then what is the implementation process? So now that you've got this infrastructure, is this going to be on a countywide basis? Like with the recess bill, you've got 134 school districts right. in Virginia right. who can opt in. Right. What happens with the kinship bill? Right. And so again, you know, we've got our um, our state department um, of children and families. Um, Department of Human Services that will be kind of putting together the, the infrastructure and the framework and then every county that delivers foster care system will, you know, at that locality will be working uh, with the state to, to implement these programs and to expand uh, this opportunity to more families. And, and I think we have to be honest too about how the opioid academic, epi epidemic has impact of Virginia and mass incarceration too. And there's a lot of reasons, there's a lot of reasons that children end up in foster care, but certainly two of them that most people can look around and understand are mass incarceration of parents and the opioid epidemic. Absolutely, and I think that's why it is so incredibly important that we continue to look for, you know, ways to, to address both of those issues. Um, you know, looking at, uh, we, you know, we're going to continue the, this session and, and next to look at ways to address the opioid epidemic and uh, and as well as the mass incarceration and um, rehabilitation is, is something that we did focus a bit on and I'm very proud of this budget that we passed was able to put some resources towards that for uh, incarcerated individuals to be able to, to to really do more in the area of rehabilitation. Right. I mean, that once you've paid your debt to society, you should come out with skills and education and an opportunity. And unfortunately, there's just too many people who continue to pay and pay and pay and pay because they're felons. Mm -hmm. And we can mm -hmm. talk about that when we get back. <laughs> we are having such a great conversation with um, Delegate Carrie Delaney, who's actually down in Richmond doing some of the really important legislation that all of us recognize needs to be tackled. She is one of 15 freshman delegates who were elected in 2017, and they really have changed the dynamic tremendously in the House of Delegates. And when we get back, we are going to really dig deeper into what Carrie Delaney hopes to do in the 2019 session, which will again start in January. And I'm going to encourage all of you as you listen to her to think about the things you want to take to your delegate, to take to your senator, how you want to organize other people in your community, other parents, to come and bring suggested legislation to these delegates. Join us after the break. So I just moved in with this family and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. Hmm. So how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one-fourth of one-half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh, no. But today, I was ready. 
I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. I know. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it, or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. We are talking with Delegate Carrie Delaney from House District 67. And someone actually posted a question um, asking Carrie, how if they have suggested legislation or an idea, do they find other people, you know, and, and bring it to their legislator? How would somebody say, I, I, I have an idea, but I don't know if other people have this idea? Mm -hmm. What would you suggest to somebody? I would suggest contact your legislator directly. If you go to the Commonwealth of Virginia's website, you can find your district, you can put in your zip code, find your legislator, and call them directly and let them know what your idea is or what the problem is that you need some help solving. Because I think some of our best ideas for legislation come from citizens who call with an issue. They call you know, a, a unique experience that they've had that you wouldn't necessarily realize is a problem until you've been through it and uh, to be able to give us a call and let us know what you're facing and, and what kind of fix might be needed. Uh, I think that those are some of the best ideas for legislation that we get. So give us a timeline. So even though you're in session, just to dispel, you know, first of all, it takes a tremendous amount of money to run a race, especially when you're running as a first time candidate against an incumbent. You raise an enormous amount of money. Uh, once you got into the legislator, legislature, you spent a, an intense amount of time looking through thousands of bills. But you're not ever off the clock. When you are back in your district, because I know you are attending ribbon cuttings and town halls and, you know, every group that wants you to be there, you're there. So you're never not working as a legislator. But when people have ideas, when should they reach out to you based on the process of when you draft bills, mm -hmm. drop bills, when they go on the official list of bills? What is that timeline for people who are interested? I would say as soon as session is over, which um, we just finished our long session, which ended in, in March, um, we'll be ending kind of late February in, in 2019. So pretty much as soon as the, the formal session is, is over, that's a good time to start talking about legislation because that's when we have the opportunity to really start doing the homework and digging deep. I've got some bills that I'm drafting and working on right now that were ideas brought up at the very first set of office hours that I had as soon as I got back home into the That's district. Um, you know, we hold office hours about once a month and we have town halls uh, pretty regularly as well. But especially with the office hours, people can come to the library and sit at a table with me and just talk about what, you know, what are their ideas or issues or concerns. And it's a really great way to just have that one-on-one -on -one conversation about those really specific concerns or questions or ideas or, or problems that people need help with. And um, I, we've got some pretty neat ideas already from just talking to, uh, to people who live in the district that have come with their unique perspective and so we're in the process right now of doing that research and working with stakeholders talking about bill language to make sure that things are ready uh, to file and um, you can start filing bills now um, in the fall uh, a lot of people wait till a little bit closer to really submit the, the legislation because you want to make sure that once it's out there that you run it by the right sets of eyes. Right. <laughs> it's better, better to fix a, a, an issue with language now than when you're standing at the podium in right. front of a committee. So uh, that's, you know, that's one of the great things about um, finishing the first year is now we have 
you've got time, time. the luxury of time. It's, it appeared that way. Yeah. You know, it goes rather quickly. And I know that that was what I what I'd said uh, getting out of sessions. Wow, we have all summer to draft these bills and meet with all these people. But you're, as you said, Wrong. we are we are running um, a pretty uh, intense operation year round. And yeah. So um, it, there there it, it is a lot of demand uh, on the schedule to to do you know to do um, what we do. But are you limited to the number of bills as a delegate? This short session we will be. So that's what I thought. I remembered the short session they limit you to the right, number of bills. Right. Right. So we'll be limited to I think 15 bills uh, during the short session, which we're coming up on now. And so that that's part of the the juggle for this part of the year too. Is you know you might have some really a ton of really great ideas that right. that you want. But the other good thing is you can file all of those bills and have them drafted. And then if it just turns out that it's more than you can carry, but you know you know I know that another neighboring delegate uh, would be really interested in this. I know that's an issue that you know she's really passionate about. You can share that that bill idea as well, and so that's an, uh, something to consider for constituents as well. If they have an idea for something to carry, even if it's not something that is in their delegate's wheelhouse, they may very well be able to help find a, an appropriate sponsor because we do have, each of us have areas of interest that we are bringing that passion down to the General Assembly. And so, you know, I, I'm interested in issues with child welfare and victim services. And so that might be a subject matter that if someone who's in a completely different wheelhouse uh, might say, hey, I, you know, I don't know if that's quite something I want to tackle because I don't know a lot about it, but I could go bring that to Carrie Delaney because that's an issue that's she's true. really into. And, and yeah, and delegates too, you know, I think Eileen Fillercorn has done a lot for the disability community. She's done a lot with sexual violence. And so right. you find that when you've got success, a de delegate has success, that is somebody groups will go to because mm -hmm. they realize she's already building on right. a success in certain subject areas. Right. Right, exactly. But but we're certainly not limited in what we can do. And I mean, you know, there, there's bills that you carry that may be out of your professional wheelhouse. But as long as you have the stakeholder support to uh, to put it together, everything that you need to to make a compelling argument, we can be successful. And because it really is about solving problems. And, and that's so so what's on your hit parade? If you want to share, you don't have to share <laughs> everything. But like, what what are you really focusing a lot of energy on right now as far as filing your bills? Yeah. Well, we're we're kind of in the research phase right now about some. some bills, of course, in the child welfare area, just because that is my professional background. I'm, I'm certainly exploring some options there. Um, there were some bills that we started with last session, but as we mentioned, the, the turnaround time is just so quick that sometimes you realize um, a few weeks in that, you know, there's, there's a bill just needs a little more time than you have. You right. might need stakeholders that say, I need to look at this for a few months. We, you know, yeah. we're not going to be able to get, get back to you um, about how we really feel about this until maybe next session. So there, there's some of those types of bills that um, we're going to be kind of continuing to, to streamline the language and make sure that we do it does what we want it to do. I think that that's one of the, the challenging pieces um, about filing and drafting and filing your bills is you, you need to make sure the language does exactly what you want it to do and nothing more. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. And yes, so, I've learned that too. Absolutely. Don't ask for everything. And, and the other thing I think is important is sometimes it takes a long time, like the earned in income tax credit for, for Virginia to even have that. Not every state has a state earned income tax credit. John Horsch was on the show and he's been doing advocacy since 1983 and said it took 10 years. 10 years, right. and I think that was under Janet Howe, actually, right. to actually get it. Now right. the governor has come out today. It's in three different newspapers that the government that the governor says we have a, a tax windfall, and mm -hmm. so we should fully fund, fully refund the state EITC. So now, after having it killed in committee mm -hmm. for years and years and years, this one narrow thing, like we have it, but we want to fully refund it. Right. So this will be another year where we hope to get out of the committee. Right. So. I, I think people need to understand sometimes you don't get it. The, the recess bill was not how it always <laughs> works, right? Right. Some, sometimes it takes a little bit more uh, work on something. And sometimes it takes the, the right uh, set of circumstances for people to feel like, okay, this is the right year for, for this. Um, you know, when, when circumstances like a tax windfall right. would be something that if that didn't exist before, you're, you're going to have people who maybe feel a little more uh, confident about confident being able to fund it. To fund it, yeah. exactly. Um, 
And then there's other matters where you just want to make sure the language is just right. I'd carried a, um, a bill that dealt with non-disclosure agreements as related to sexual yes. assault and harassment, which is obviously such a big issue right now. It seems like every time we turn on the news, somebody Part of the is Me Too movement. Yes. Exactly, someone is um, you know is is being called out for you know a role in in some form of sexual harassment and the question of people getting paid, non-disclosure agreements. How do you manage this and uh, and so that was a, a, a good example of a bill that I think everybody that heard it on the committee would say that, yeah, we, this is important and we need to address it and we support the notion that you're trying to solve this problem. But when you're crafting that kind of language, you need to make sure that there are no unintended consequences. And it's a very difficult thing to maneuver that you know sometimes you have a victim who would like to have a non-disclosure agreement. So we can't just say non-disclosure agreements are, you know, right. are, are not allowed because that may be how a victim would like to to handle a situation what we what we're trying to accomplish with the legislation is to remove um, any type of, of coercion and and simply restore the balance of power that you don't have someone you know kind of pushing over a contract and a check with his team of lawyers standing behind him and a woman feeling right. somewhat powerless to say okay can I have this looked at by someone <laughs> or whatever that might be and so simply trying to balance balance things a bit in the favor of the victim to make sure that the victim is the one that's really holding the cards in that kind of situation. You kind of alluded to having, you know, work groups or, or conference committees to work out language when a bill kind of is in process to smooth some of that out. But sometimes they also default to study groups, don't mm -hmm. they? Like when you in the committee process when you're like we can't seem to move forward on this, but it's worth putting together a study. Right, right. And I think that that, that does come to, you know, where we can all agree that it's a good problem that we need to solve, but that it's a complex problem, that it's not always as easy as just changing one thing in the code. It's going to, it needs to be worked on in such a way that you ensure that there are no unintended consequences. And that's where, you know, one thing that that we really recognize going through the process is that every word that's in a bill is there for a reason. Every word that's there does something, and if it doesn't, it probably doesn't need to be in, in the bill. And right. so really making sure that the language captures not only the, the, the heart of what you want to accomplish, but when you codify it, that it's actually doing exactly what you want it to do, and it's not doing more and harming some other unintended area. Right. And that, that's the part that I think is, is most challenging and sometimes not always seen, that, um, that we have to really not just look at, I understand the spirit of what you're trying to do, but the language that we're crafting actually has to be able to do that too. And that, that can be a tricky process, which is great to have the time over the summer to work through some of that. And um, that's where you know this being a good time of year to reach your legislature, legislator about ideas that you might have, because in the summer and the fall, we still have some time to pull Put those together. stakeholders together and pull it together, because that's what's going to give you the best success of carrying a bill is coming up with something that you know that that is reasonable, does the right thing, doesn't doesn't affect something else in, in the wrong way. That people at this point, especially while you know while I'm part of a minority party, as I mentioned before, we have to make sure that our bills, if we want to solve a problem, we have to find the common ground solution. And you do. You do. Working across the aisle to solve problems becomes extremely critical when we're down in Richmond. You know that doesn't. We don't talk about that as much during the campaign. I, I talked about it a bit during my campaign because I felt that was a big value that is missing in politics a little bit too much these days. That notion that we need to put the the, the party par politics and political games aside and focus on solutions and put the people first. So one final thought in the last few seconds here. You will be running for re-election again in 2019 because when you're a delegate, it's every other year. That's so right. People need to remember after session, isn't it? They'll, you'll be back at their door. That's right. right. We'll be right back out there and always available and certainly will be on the doors uh, before you know it, but always available to people in the district. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Carrie. This has been Thank very you. enlightening. Oh, it was fun to be here. It, this was great. And I encourage everybody to get involved. Call your legislator, find out who they are, and present your ideas.